Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning or afternoon, as I know some people are joining from Asia. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for joining us in our webinar today. So uh, my name is Emily King and I'll be hosting this webinar. Um, my role is Business Engagement Officer um, of the Fairwild Foundation. And so I work with current and potential Fairwild businesses to help them understand um, how to make the most of their certification, um, as well as wider communication around the importance of Fairwild. Um, we've also got some great guest speakers lined up today and we're all really excited to talk to you about Fairwild and hear some of your questions. Right, but now the housekeeping is out of the way, uh, what are we going to talk to you about today? Well, first off, we'll hear about why uh, we need to think about wild plants and consider wild plant sourcing at all. Then we'll learn a bit more about what Fairwild is and how it relates to those wild plant sourcing issues. Then we'll hear from one of our own certified collection operations about their Fairwild story. So that's Gus from Bioba is joining us today. Um, and then we'll dive a bit more into the certification process in more detail. So both how you apply for certification and how you might also want to prepare yourselves for an audit. Um, and then there'll be time for your questions. But to begin, why care about wild at all? Um, so many of you will already be familiar with wild sourcing of plants, as that's the sort of central role of your business as collectors. Um, and in that, we really recognise that collection operations often act as custodians of nature. Um, but for those that might not be as familiar with wild sourcing or also sort of at the global level, um, I thought it'd be really good to take a step back and think about how wild is perceived, uh, what the situation is and how end users um, view wild plants. So first an overview, what really is the scale of wild plant use um, and, and trade? So uh, we know that a, about 28,000 wild plant species have well-documented um, medicinal and aromatic uses. Um, about 3,000 species are traded internationally and the majority of those are wild harvested. So it really is a large scale trade. We also see that uh, trade in plant products are rising in value um, and, and scale. Um, and it truly is a global trade, as I said. So we've got importers from um, you know, the, the Americas, Asia, Europe. Um, it's being uh, exported from sort of similar range of countries. So it really is happening all over the world at a large scale. But for those that perhaps might not be familiar with the range of, of plant products, you know, there are all of those um, sort of nearly 30,000 species. Where do we start? What do we think about? What sort of species characterise this trade? Um, so one of our partner organisations, Traffic, has put together the list, list of, of 12 species they, they are referring to as the wild dozen. And these are species that um, are either sort of flagships of wild plant trade. Um, they have lots of opportunities for um, you know, sort of social benefits, um, environmental benefits, but maybe some of them are also seeing challenges. Um, so th these are 12 species. You can read more about these in the Wild at Home report. Um, but these are ones that maybe are good to, to think about when we're talking about wild plant sourcing. So frankincense, baobab, which of course we're going to hear more about from Gus today, is their Fair Wild certified baobab. Um, but many people do not uh, sort of realise the, the scale of wild plant species in, in everyday products. So this can be a helpful way of thinking about it. But of course, it's not just about the plant species, it's also about the people that harvest them. Um, so those that ha harvest wild plant species, that there are millions of people, um, it can be that they're in uh, sort of lower income communities, they might be relying on wild plants for, for um, sort of herbal remedies as well as their income. And much of the trade uh, can be informal, and, and underreported, especially if it's happening domestically as, as well as internationally. Also, the regulations around harvesting and trade in wild plants can be very complex. Um, there's not just national level legislation, but also international agreements to take into account. And there have been uh, declines in numbers of those collecting wild plant resources and also the loss um, with sort of migration and um, moving to, to cities and from rural areas, loss of traditional knowledge and practices. There's also the uh, backdrop, of course, of the current environmental context. So we're seeing 
uh, the impacts of climate change on uh, changes in species distribution and harvests. Um, we've also seen, you know, decline in species globally. Uh, so I'm not talking about plants specifically now, but across all sort of biological um, spheres, there is sort of decline in species. And all of this can equal uh, biodiversity loss. So against this backdrop of, um, you know, the situation with wild plants and, and the environment globally, what, how do consumers feel about, um, you know, sustainability and what they might want to see in terms of sustainability? Um, well, some research has actually shown recently that consumers are increasingly thinking about um, the impact that the products they buy have on the world. So a 2019 survey, for example, showed uh, two thirds of respondents looked for brands and were loyal to brands that had a positive impact. Um, a more recent survey showed that um, nearly half of consumers are thinking about sustainable choices in light of COVID and, you know, the sort of new normal that we're all adjusting to. Equally, we can see that, um, you know, sales of herbal products are increasing. Uh, so there was, uh, you know, an over 8% increase in 2019. It's expected to be even bigger in 2020. Um, we're also seeing changes in light of, of COVID. Um, and there's a report that I've included here on how, uh, you know, sort of demand for traditional sort of respiratory treatments and, and immune treatments has increased. And similarly, that we're now seeing research showing that um, consumers aren't just looking for, you know, natural claims or, or sort of more general claims, but they're looking for real specifics in terms of what brands mean and businesses mean about their sustainability. We're also seeing that brands are responding. So they're, they're looking at this increasing um, sort of change in consumer behavior and looking to really use wild both as a marketing tool, but also a way to, to lead the way in sustainability. Um, and that is often through certification. So thinking about certification, you know, that's obviously one of the things that Fair Wild, Fair Wild does and what we're here to talk to you about today. Um, in terms of what certification offers for those at the, the sort of end of the chain, you know, the people that might be buyers of certified ingredients. For Fair Wild certification, it can show that they're contributing to the sustainable development goals. You know, Fair Wild contributes to six of the 17 um, sustainable development goals. There are lots of positive stories that can be told about sourcing from the wild um, and the impact of sustainable use. Um, there's lots of really great human stories that can be told, you know, maybe harvesting techniques that have been passed down generations. Um, what great things a Fair Wild Premium Fund has been used to provide. Um, but then also nice, really great stories about the wild places that these ingredients originate from and, and what sort of animal species might be co-benefiting from, from the sustainable use of these plant ingredients. So against that background of the sort of current state of of uh, both wild sourcing, but also wild plant use. We're now going to turn to, to Bryony Morgan um, about what Fair Wild is and how it fits into this changing landscape. Um, so Bryony is the executive officer of the Fair Wild Foundation um, and she coordinates the foundation's program of work and brings a decade of experience in wild plant trade and Fair Wild to us today. So we're going to hear from Bryony now. So take it away, Bryony. Thanks very much, Emily, and it's really great to have the opportunity to speak to everyone today. And I think we have a lot of people who are from wild collection operations on the call, but also a broader pool of people listening who might be from other parts of the industry or organisations that are connected to the wild plants trade. So we'll try to make this relevant for everybody involved. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Emily. Right. So what is Fair Wild? Well, the Fair Wild standard is a sustainability, sustainability standard with a third party audited certification system and it covers wild sourced ingredients. So we're mainly working with wild plant ingredients at the moment, but the standard itself is also applicable to fungi and lichen and we'd like to expand into that in the future. Uh, the standard combines, oh sorry, back please. The standard combines fair trade principles with ecological sustainability. It goes across environmental, social and economic aspects of sustainability. So it's quite a comprehensive approach to the trade. 
the sustainability standard actually came out of standard setting initiatives that took place primarily between 2005 and 2010. So responding to both conservation and development um, concerns and with funding from the Swiss and German governments who invested into creating this set of principles for sustainability certification. Okay, next slide, thanks. Farewell Foundation itself is a Swiss nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded in 2008 um, alongside the process of standard setting to really be the institution that would manage the standard and drive it forward to be taken up by the industry. So we have a mission to really transform resource management and business practices to be sustainable throughout the supply chain for wild products. A large number of organizations have actually contributed to the creation of the standard and we work with many of them today still in different collaborative relationships. So for example, the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, um, we have a collaboration with to review uh, species that are proposed for certification. WWF was one of the um, organizations that was on the, the steering group for creation of one of the precursors to Fairwild. And we still have a number of collaborations, particularly in uh, particular geographies and, and trade chains for promoting sustainability. And ProFound is a consulting organization that has contributed to Fairwild and also does a lot of training and value chain analysis work around wild collection. Um, I myself am actually based with the organization Traffic, Emily as well. We have a partnership agreement between Fairwild Foundation and Traffic, which includes hosting the Secretariat of Fairwild. Uh, so Emily and I are, are both based in the UK, although Fairwild is, is a Swiss organization legally. Uh, we have a few new collaborations that are developing. So a new one is with the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network, which is another certification initiative which works on uh, cons conservation of key species in landscapes. And we also have other collaborations that are developing, for example, with the Sustainable Herbs Program of the American Botanical Council. Okay, next one. So our work, uh, well, a real core part of our work is to manage the Fairwild standard, including revision processes for it. We're a subscriber to the ICL Alliance, so we follow good practice principles in, in managing the standard. Uh, we manage the certification system itself, and we also control use of the Fairwild label on finished products. And then we have a, a big role to play in the Secretariat as well to connect current and potential Fairwild businesses. So promoting the standard as we're doing today and encouraging more people to join in. And then we can also provide some capacity building and support around the issues that we work on. So the certification scheme itself, the main features are um, the, the, the certification itself is for wild collection operations. So it's based on the compliance of, of the companies with the Fairwild performance indicators. It's a program that requires an on-site annual audit by a third party control body. Obviously in 2020, that's been incredibly diff difficult to do. So in practice this year, we are mainly doing remote audits of the currently certified operations and, and working out what, what we'll be able to do going forward, considering all of the travel restrictions that are mostly in place in different parts of the world. But we'll come back to that later in the presentation. Uh, Fairwild is a continuous improvement approach. So sustainability is never really achieved. We're something that we all always work towards and improve our performance on. And that continuous improvement approach is embedded in Fairwild. And we also, we make a distinction in practice based on the type of species that are being proposed. So it's a broad church and we have all sorts of different species that are within the certification system, but the requirements are less rigorous, for example, for a low risk species, something that's very widespread and, and common, like nettle, for example, as opposed to a, a higher risk species, perhaps one where there's destructive harvesting and the species is, is more sensitive to that. So the Fairwild standard itself, it is one of the 
really very few tools that are solely focused on wild collection. It's a very comprehensive approach. It can be used worldwide. We don't have any restrictions there. And it covers the scope from products collected from, from the wild through to finished products. Okay, next slide. So the principles cover four different areas for wild collection operations. So wild collection and conservation requirements, both focused on the target species itself, whether it's being maintained and harvested at a rate that's sustainable, and also looking at the landscape that the, the, the species is harvested from. So are there any negative environmental impacts of the wild collection on other species that are present in the area? Uh, it also covers legal and ethical requirements. So complying with laws, for example, around protected areas, making sure that nothing is being harvested from areas where it shouldn't. But it also includes respecting customary rights. So rights that might not be part of the formal legal system of, of a country, but um, nonetheless very important to be respected. Um, as part of the process of commercial harvesting of the resource. It also covers social and fair trade requirements. We really look at the contractual relationship between the wild collection company and the, the collectors who are supplying them because collectors are usually not employees. They're people who are supplying ingredients, maybe paid on, you know, buying a kilo of what they collect. So we, we look very much at what is the relationship like between those those different parties and is it fair? Fair Wild doesn't completely exclude the participation of children in wild collection activities because actually that's an important cultural aspect of wild harvesting in many parts of the world but children must not be part of the workforce so we look very carefully at whether any children are involved in harvesting and are they being exploited or treated in a way where the wild harvesting is actually interrupting their education and other aspects of their well-being. It's a fair trade system, so we also have a fair pricing element, so ensuring that collectors are being paid at a level that is, is enough for their, their needs. And we also have the premium fund approach, so an additional payment that is paid into a collective fund that can be used for priorities of the collection communities and we look at labour rights and working conditions for workers in wild collection operations. On the management and traceability side <coughs> we um, look at how the resources are managed so is there a management plan in place are the collectors trained and supervised in practice and then we look at responsible business practices, for example, on aspects of traceability and also price setting and, and the relationship with the buyer. And we also have a very important principle 11, which is for the buyers from our collection operations. We promote buyer commitment and we also work very hard to get brands and uh, traders to commit to Fairwild by um, agreeing to pay fair prices to the wild collection operations and support them in other ways. Okay, next one. So how to actually participate in Fair Wild. So this is a simplified chain of custody for Fair Wild. Um, you can see along the bottom of this slide the three types of company that we define in the Fair Wild system. In practice there's often overlap between these different different categories and you can get a company that is um, present in more than one of these categories but we have the Fairwild certified collection operations so these are companies that are actually managing harvest of the resource so for example Bioba we'll hear from Gus later these companies actually receive the the annual audit and they will be certified against the standard we also have registered processors and traders. So these are companies that buy from the certified collection operations and, and sell the ingredients on, perhaps after doing some processing. Um, these companies register directly with the Fairwild Foundation, as do brand manufacturers, that, which are companies um, that are using ingredients in their finished products. 
uh, the brand manufacturers will also sign a license agreement with us if they want to use the Fairwild label in labeling and marketing their products. So the requirements, oh, sorry, Emily, but the requirements for the traders and um, manufacturers are mainly laid out in the trading rules and labeling rules and requirements for the collection operations are mainly laid out in the Fairwild standard itself. Okay, thank you. Right, so labelling. Um, once ingredients are certified and traded through to brand manufacturers who would like to use the label, they can use it on their products and in marketing materials. So here we've actually got some examples of some of the brands that we're working with at the moment, including three tea companies, Pucker Herbs, Traditional Medicinals, Neil's Yard Remedies, also Dr. Jackson's. Um, examples of, of tea companies that are using the Fairwild label on, on their products. Um, the package that we've got there is organic licorice root. Uh, licorice was actually the first ingredient that was certified under the Fairwild standard and it's, it's quite an important one as it's used in quite a range of, of wild um, um, products that use wild ingredients, for example, herbal teas. We've also got other brand companies for example, um, a gin, which uses Fairwild certified juniper berries. And we've got um, Baobab using it, it being used in a range of different products, including both cosmetics, but also food products, such as um, La Potion, a Baobab drink that we've got as an example here. Um, and Fairwild is also being used in ingredient supplements and traditional medicinals, uh, traditional medicines such as Trifola which we've got here from Banyan Botanicals. So label products are already available on, on the market globally. So just a little bit more about Fairwild in the international context, um, just to, to, to see how the standard is actually being used globally. The Fairwild standard is actually recognized as a tool to support delivery of the CBD's global strategy on plant conservation. So it's been recognized in policy spheres. Uh, it's actually the proxy indicator of its success on um, the targets on sustainable use of wild plant ingredients. It's also been um, used to support the implementation of CITES regulations, so international regulations on trade and endangered species. The experience of developing the stand Fairwild standard also fed into developing guidelines for uh, non-detriment findings under CITES. And now there's some interest in looking at how voluntary certification standards can actually support implementation of the legal framework itself. And Fairwild in a recent analysis came out as really the best fitting standard because of our focus the, the degree of focus on wild resource management. It also provides most of the information that's needed in um, international regulations that support the trade. And as Emily's already mentioned, um, Fairwild is a great tool to give businesses a concrete way of how they are actually contributing to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. We cover um, reduce aspects of non-discrimination and um, supporting the position of women as workers in the supply chain. So we contribute in, in many different ways to these goals. Next one. All right, so Fairwild, uh, when we started with the Fairwild standard, it was really the only initiative that was looking at wild plants in any depth. Um, other certifications have, have started to cover this area a little bit, but I think it's still fair to say that Fairwild is the most comprehensive and rigorous certification for wild plants. We're very complementary to organic certification. Organic is much in demand in the uh, herbal products industry, so many of the wild collection operations that we work with also have organic certification. We cover some of the same principles, but we go much further in terms of the resource management requirements. Our fair trade principles are similar really to other fair trade systems, but we're solely focused on wild collection. So we really look at the types of um, 
structure that you have in Wild Collection and the role of, of free, freelance certif um, wild, collect wild collectors. So um, we're quite specialised on, on wild harvesting arrangements, but we are open to recognitions and collaborations with other systems. So for example, uh, Fair Wild is one of the standards that's recognised under the Fair for Life programme. So Fair Wild certified ingredients can feed into Fair for Life um, supply chains and products with a fairly simple recognition process. And as I mentioned, we have this collaboration with the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network. And we would be interested to find any wild collection operations that would be interested in a co-implementation approach. Okay, so yeah, we have a growing network of companies involved in Fair Wild around the world. You can find out more about them on our um, website. We have, I think, 12 different certified operations around the world and quite a few more in the process of application. You can also see applicants now listed on our website. And we're working with a uh, network of traders and brands as well, as I've already mentioned, and we've put some of the logos of the traders here as well. So beyond those that are already listed on our website, we do have a, a wider pool of companies that we're working with. So we hope that more will, will join us and, and participate in the Fair Wild system. Okay, next one. And as I mentioned, um, we do have this role to help businesses connect. So you can use our website. Brand companies can look on there to find both Fair Wild certified ingredients and also ones that are in the process of becoming available. You can also get in touch with the Fair Wild Secretariat to actually make connections. And we organize a number of industry events and outreach. We normally exhibit every year at Biofac, the organic um, fair trade, uh, the, sorry, the organic trade fair. Uh, we'll see what happens in 2021, but um, we're present in the industry and we promote Fair Wild there. And as I mentioned, applicants can now be listed on the website. So if you have an application in process, we'll be able to list you there for up to three years while your um, entry into Fair Wild is in process. So we can help you find more, more buyers and get some profile in that way. Right. Yeah, so we'll just finish on a very nice quote we had from the American Botanical Council, um, which was made in, in the context of award we won this year from the Nutrition Business Journal. Fair Wild certification is not a fad, it is a trend. Uh, we very much hope that's the case. We have quite a lot of experience behind us already, and we're hoping that more companies will join us this year. All right, thank you, Emily. Right, thank you so much for that, Bryony. That was a really great introduction to Fair Wild and a sort of setting the scene for what certification is and what it covers and, and what it means. Um, but now we're going to hear from a company that has actually um, achieved Fair Wild certification. So uh, we're going to hear from Gus uh, Le Breton. So he is the co-founder of Bioba, um, a Zimbabwe-based bear bab producing company, um, and they are proudly Fair Wild certified. Um, Gus is passionate about conservation of plants through the provision of economic incentives to rural people, uh, mainly around commercialization of indigenous plants. Um, Bayoba has been Fair Wild certified since 2016. Uh, so Gus is now going to tell us a bit more about what that means to them. Thank you, Gus. Good. Thanks very much. Um, and hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people out there. Um, so yes, I will just quickly summarize what Fairwild has meant for us. Uh, we are, as Emily said, we're processing baobab fruit from Zimbabwe into food and cosmetic ingredients. You can go on. Uh, the baobab tree, for those of you that don't know it, um, it's this big iconic tree. Uh, it's got lots of different names. It features in lots of different myths and legends. Uh, it's found all over Africa. It grows in quite uh, significant quantities in very hot, very dry areas, which means it's very important to the livelihoods of people living in those areas because uh, there's not a lot else that grows in those places. 
Uh, it's also very, very important being a, something of a kind of a keystone species that's quite important uh, from a biodiversity point of view um, as, as habitat for other species. Uh, huge big trees, um, very well known for their kind of characteristic silhouette. Uh, we have a tree in Zimbabwe that's uh, been carbon dated at over two and a half thousand years old. Um, so they are very long living um, and, and very, very hardy trees. They survive an incredible diversity of climatic conditions. They produce this fruit, which is uh, a round fruit. Uh, you can see it top left there on the slide. Um, it's kind of a woody outer shell, a bit like a coconut. And inside is a mixture of powder, which is the, the fruit pulp, which is naturally dry and seed. Um, and then, uh, you can go to the next slide. We produce from uh, the product we produce, uh, from, from the fruit we produce two products. Uh, one is a food ingredient, which is the powder, and the other one is a cosmetic ingredient, which is the seed oil. So the business model um, is quite simple. Uh, there are several thousand rural harvesters in our operation who collect fruit all of them are both, uh, well, all of them are organically certified and quite a number of them have also been uh, fair wild certified and they are all pre-contracted. Um, they've all been independently inspected, uh, uh, both in terms of the compliance with the certification standards, but also from a food safety point of view. They collect the fruit, uh, they bring the fruit to centralized buying points, we buy the fruit and then we take them to processing centers where we crack open the fruit and uh, we, we then uh, remove the inner pulp from the shell and then we take that to the factory and then we process in the factory to separate out uh, the powder and then the seeds from which we make the oil. Uh, and then we also have the byproducts which are the, the press cake as well as the, the shells of the fruit. Next. And then I think next. So uh, why did we decide to pursue fair wild certification? Well, our kind of core mantra as a business was uh, to promote biodiversity conservation. I'm actually an ecologist myself. I come from that background. Uh, I started out by looking at uh, our landscape in Zimbabwe, uh, which is, uh, obviously constantly the, the natural biodiversity is constantly under threat from uh, primarily from conversion to arable agriculture. Of course, we need arable agriculture to feed ourselves, but a lot of the areas uh, in, where rural people live in Zimbabwe are very dry and there's not much benefit from converting indigenous uh, plants to uh, agriculture, much better to keep them in situ. You get a healthier landscape, obviously better for biodiversity. And if there are revenue opportunities from managing the, the indigenous plants, then that's better economically for rural people as well. And that, of course, is the challenge. So we set up this business as a tool to promote biodiversity conservation by creating economic value uh, from the baobab trees so that rural people would have an incentive to look after them. So, th so that's, I mean, biodiversity is right at the heart of our motivation. Uh, in this kind of new era of what they sometimes refer to as radical transparency, the social media era where there's no secrets from anyone, uh, we also would like to be able to differentiate ourselves from our competitors. Baobab's found in 30 different countries in Africa. Um, many of them have companies that are producing baobab and you know how do we differentiate ourselves from the others uh, we know that we're following ethical and sustainable practices but how do we demonstrate that to our customers it's all very well for us to say hey guys we're really good uh, but it really helps if you can have an independent credible mechanism to do that okay next we're already certified as organic, um, but we wanted something that uh, reflected both biodiversity and fair trade. So organic certification is important to a lot of our customers. In fact, we, we only produce organically certified product. There's basically no demand for, for non-organic uh, power bubs. So 
for us, that's just a given. That's the kind of baseline. Uh, but we wanted something that really, you know, measured the biodiversity and the fair trade impacts. And preferably if we could do them both at the same time, that would make it easier. Uh, and then Fair Wild came along and Fair Wild is the only scheme that really does that. Um, you know, it's a fully credible independent scheme managed by uh, highly respected players in the international certification uh, arena. And I mean, the only reason for us to even think twice about it was the fact that that Fair Wild is still pretty new on the market as there's not that much brand recognition. So we are constantly finding ourselves having to tell the story to, to other people, you know, who Fair Wild are and, and why it's important. Um, and of course, that's, you know, that, that, that's the one reason we would have hesitated. Next. So we decided we were going to go for it. We contacted the Fair Wild Foundation. We said we would like to do uh, certify our baobab. They had never certified baobab before. So the first thing that they have to do under the, the, the kind of um, procedures is to commission a desktop review on the risk factors around sustainability. So I think Bryony mentioned that there's different categories, kind of low risk, medium risk, high risk. And they needed to figure out, you know, what's the baseline with, with Baobab. So that review was conducted by um, the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group. They then uh, give their recommendations and that um, informs the kind of audit process. Next. Uh, so before we could have our first audit, um, we had to make preparations in two areas. The first one was on the sustainability side. Uh, we had to conduct a baseline resource assessment. How much baobab is there? What are the sustainable offtake levels? How would we measure the sustainability of harvesting? And then we had to actually set up a resource monitoring system to do that. And then next, we also had to uh, make preparations on the fair trade side. Um, so again, for us, uh, you know, we, Inherently, we, our, our uh, business approach is uh, fair trade, we would believe, but there are certain mechanisms that uh, we did not have in place that do have to be in place in order for it to be independently assessed. Um, and that's specifically the kind of in terms of the producer organization. So we needed to establish those mechanisms uh, that would allow for uh, premiums to come in and then to be distributed to the harvesters. There has to be a legally recognized fair trade producer group. Um, and of course that producer group must also have a clear idea of what they're gonna do with any premiums and revenues that come in. Yeah, next. So uh, this was probably about from us, you know, making the decision that we were going to pursue fair wild certification. It probably took us about a year. I'm going to guess. I don't. I don't remember exactly to get to the point where we were now ready to have our first inspection. And the first auditor that we got was a professor of botany, and he, yeah, there was absolutely no way we were going to speed him through this process. He was extremely meticulous and, and thorough um, on both the sustainability side and the fair trade side. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a, it was a great experience for us. Uh, it was, it took us a lot of time, it cost us a lot of money, um, and, and uh, there was a lot of uh, preparation that went into it. But it did really help us to, you know, to think um, from an outsider's perspective about some of the, the issues that perhaps, you know, we just take them for granted because we, we deal with them on a daily basis. But having to explain to someone from the outside why we do this, why we don't do that, uh, was really, really useful. Um, and uh, Fair Wild has, as, as Bryony said, it's not, uh, it's not kind of a, a standard, you get there or you don't get there. It's a process of continuous improvement. And we've been at it now. This is our fifth inspection just coming up. So uh, we've been, you know, the bar continually gets higher and higher. Next. 
So um, every audit is a pretty challenging thing. Uh, we, you know, you'd never take the process for granted. You know, you're going to get grilled, and uh, that's you know that's that's part of it. But I personally, I really enjoy having the auditor come uh, because for me, it's kind of an, a, a once a year uh, reality check for us. Uh, are are we doing what we say we're doing? Uh, is what we're doing the most effective way to achieve the impacts that we want to achieve in terms of uh, social and, and biodiversity. And uh, I've, you know, I've enjoyed it always consistently. We've, we've had uh, different auditors uh, and we, we combine, fortunately, the company, the audit company that does our fair wild certification is the same company that does our organic certification. Uh, which makes it a little bit more efficient. So we have both inspections simultaneously, although they're very different. Uh, so that, that, that makes it, yeah, slightly better for us. Next one. Okay, and then the challenges, as I said uh, earlier, the main one is in terms of brand recognition, not that many people know what Fairwild is. And so when we explain it, um, you know, we have to really explain it in detail. Another big challenge for us is that uh, many of our customers love the fact that we're certified, but when we tell them, okay, so if you want to buy Fairwild certified uh, powder, you're going to have to pay the premium. And then they go, mm, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, it's been frustrating for us how many of our customers love the fact and they like to brag that they're buying from the only Fairwild certified power bar producer, but they don't want to actually buy the Fairwild certified powder because that would be more expensive. Um, it, you know, I think that's changing. We, we do have some big customers that have previously been buying non Fairwild certified powder that are now talking about buying it. And I think that's gonna make a big difference to us. Uh, I just hope it happens soon. <laughs> um, the other challenge, of course, is that the audits are expensive. You know, it is expensive. It is time consuming. And the fact that, you know, having organized the harvesters in this, in this manner, in this uh, sort of fair trade uh, association, and we've, we're in the process of doing that, of course, we've created lots of expectations amongst them and then if the premiums don't come through to them uh, because customers don't buy Fairwild certified product, uh, then naturally they start to ask themselves, well, why? Why are we going through all this? So it does create a bit of a crisis of expectation. So, you know, th those are some of the main challenges. Next. But we persevere with it and we do believe very passionately in Fairwild uh, and the reasons for that are, well, firstly, there are many Baobab suppliers, but we're the only ones that are Fairwild certified. So it is a mechanism for us to differentiate ourselves. And that, that, that's important to us. Although, having said that, of course, I would love it if all uh, the Baobab producers in Africa were Fairwild certified, because I think that would be, be a good thing. But, you know, at the moment, we, we like it. It does differentiate us. We also really strongly believe that in the post-COVID era, uh, assuming we're going to get to a post-COVID era, or maybe it's just the COVID era, I don't know, uh, that there are going to be uh, more and more buyers really wanting assurances around sustainability. Uh, there's absolutely no question in my mind that there's a direct relationship between purchasing baobab products and positive biodiversity outcomes. Uh, baobab trees are incredibly important in the ecosystem and the only reason we have baobab trees still is because people value them and think they're important. If they didn't value them and they didn't think they're important, they wouldn't be there. So, but, but now we need to be able to demonstrate that and to show that. Uh, and Fairwild really is still, uh, it's the only standard that very specifically monitors the biodiversity impact of wild harvested species. So it's the, it's the one. Um, 
and we believe ultimately that it will pay off for us. Uh, so far, I would say it's cost us more than, than we've benefited from it directly. Although, of course, you never really know because we, we, we have a lot of customers that come to us because they know of all the Baobab producers, we're the only one so far that has the kind of rigor and intensity to have gone through the whole certification process. And they come to us for that reason, but then they choose not to buy the certified powder, which is frustrating. And I already mentioned that. But so we can't really tell how much, you know, it's benefited us already. Uh, but I do believe in future that uh, we will have many, many more customers that will want to and understand the reasons to buy the Fairwell certified powder and it will pay off for us. So thanks, Emily. I think that's the last one. Um, I think that uh, concludes my presentation. I hope that was all clear for you. Thank you so much, Gus. That was that was really great. Um, and it's really nice to just have more insight into your journey with Fair Wild like that. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the audience when we get to the, the Q&A section. Um, we're going to move on now to actually hear Elixir. We're going to hear from uh, Eliza Aragon. So she's the founder of Elixir and they are a Central American based essential oil producing company, um, among other things, working with cooperatives across the whole Central America region. Um, so she is passionate about sustainable livelihoods and production methods. Um, and one of the cooperatives Nix and Elixir works with has been Fairwild certified for Peru Balsam since 2017. Uh, so Eliza is now going to tell us a bit more about what that means to Elixir. Thank you, Emily. Well, I'm going to say hi to everyone, but I will remove my camera because I don't have a very good network. Well, so I think before I can start to explain what Fairwild means to Elixir, I would like to make a very short introduction of who we are. So I have a very short video that Emily is going to, uh, to upload. We are producers of natural ingredients, spices, essential oils and extracts. We're based in Latin America and have founded the company more than 10 years ago, putting sustainability at the heart of our operations. You cannot create a sustainable product from one day to another. You need to know the producers, know how they live, the socio-economic baselines they are living currently, and which solutions you will bring to the community. So it takes time, but we think the hard way, it's the only way. Cada materia prima se desarrolla en un contexto cultural y social diferente. Lo que estamos haciendo es conociendo y yendo a las comunidades para que ellos sientan que somos parte de las comunidades. Aquí ya no seguimos. Ahí, hasta ahí nomás. Cabal. ¿Sí? Entonces, cabal. Aquí tenemos un espacio para trabajar. Sí. Seguimos con esta. O si es posible, se deja hasta por aquí. Y ¿no? se deja hasta por acá. Sí. The way we do it is that we go every week, every two weeks to every community because you have to gain their trust. Most of the times they have been used, they have been abused, they have been promised things that were never delivered. So if we committed, we comply, always. El conocer a las comunidades, el conocer cada uno de nuestros proveedores, nos permite poder saber cómo los podemos involucrar. Ellos cada uno tiene una característica individual y nosotros nos adaptamos a su característica. Yo comencé a trabajar del, desde que tenía como 15 años, hace 20 años que trabajo esto yo. Gracias a mi padre que él me enseñó. Aquí, en este lugar, es el único trabajo por de pronto que lo sostiene, ¿verdad? Lo más importante que saquemos para mí este año es cuál es el precio mínimo en el que abajo de ese precio ustedes pierden plata. Entonces con eso yo... Antes de Nelixia, pues, teníamos dificultad para vender nuestro producto, ¿verdad? Y hoy, pues, gracias a Nelixia y la certificación, Fairwell, pues se obtiene el 5%. Es un extra más, un, un gran apoyo, ¿verdad? un gran apoyo para la cooperativa, para cada uno de los balsameros, ¿verdad? porque eh, nos acompaña siempre. Ok, so what we are is that we're producers of natural ingredients. So we work with more than 7,000 producers along Latin America. We're going to process those ingredients and we're going to propose those ingredients to the flavor, fragrance, cosmetic, aromatherapy, and herbs and spices market. 
So the way is that how we're doing this is that we're challenging the way the industry works to generate impact through empowering and elevating communities. So the idea is actually that we're trying to create a new standard, is that we are lucky to be at the source. So we're lucky to work with the producers and to work with the biodiversity that, uh, that's along all the raw materials we work with. So we know that we have a responsibility. And so we're not just sourcing ingredients, we're sourcing ingredients in a very sustainable way. Can you move Emily to the other slide? Great, thank you. So the idea is to be the global reference in sustainable sourcing. And actually we're really trying to create a new word, which means improving. So if I try to explain the value chain of, of, our, of, the, of the whole value chain of the products, is that you have the producers, the producers will sell their ingredients to Nelixia. Nelixia will propose all those process ingredients to the creation houses, either aromatherapy or either flavors or fragrances. And then what we're hoping is that the houses, all the brands will be able to communicate the good work we're doing at the source. As Emily said, that all the consumers are really trying to, to get a more sustainable products when they're buying this. And I think that it is mainly the responsibility to the to the companies that are doing the sourcing. So it is very important that the brands are committed to buy sustainable ingredients and committed to, to buy fair wild certification products, but they need someone to be able to have this done on the ground. So this is the responsibility, this is how we see, this is the responsibility of Nelixia that we are the ones that needs to organize a little bit all that's happening in the origin at the source. And once we are able to organize this, we're going to be able to propose certified ingredients to the brands. You can move forward. Thank you, Emily. So this, I, I am not going to be uh, very detailed in this slide because I can spend maybe one hour explaining this. But what I wanted to say is that we created a methodology, okay? So we've been doing this sourcing for more than 10 years now. And thanks to all this experience, we managed to create a methodology, okay? So this methodology has a really like, uh, we have an app with different steps that allow us all the sourcing managers on the ground to comply with several uh, standards to be able to create a sustainable ingredient. This is something we've been doing uh, all, since the beginning and we've been like um, um, creating these standards and this is going, th this has been um, improved thank you to all the standards that fair white has so we've been inspiring a lot we get inspired thanks to the fair white um, standards but this methodology has six fundamentals and as you can see the three four are fundamentals at the source so we are not producing the ingredients we are with the producers and we have the three four like meaning knowing the source like who is behind the production, uh, how are they doing, uh, a baseline of to understand how the producers are living. Then we're going to involve and respect the producers with contracts, with best agriculture practices, and then we're going to empower the communities we're working with. So these three standards help us to create a sustainable product with the producer. Well, so this is great. So if you are a client to Nelixia, you can be sure that we're going to source your ingredient to the brand like this, but it's not enough. So actually, we, we try like we are UEVT members and yes, we do things the right way. But I think that today in, in, in our world today, there is so many uh, marketing communication saying we're sustainable that I think the consumer today is not really comfortable of just saying we are sustainable. They need proof. And we choose Fairwild as a, as a, as a, a, a proving, like a third party certification body that is going to, to allow us to prove to the, to the brands that we're really doing things the right way at the source. So that's really what Fairwild means to us. Um, we, we have all the paperwork already done. So it was, 
easy let's not it's not easy because it's not really easy but it was easier for us thanks to our methodology but actually without fair wild we won't be able to prove to all our clients and customers that we're doing things the right way so actually i my my message today was really saying that i think the world is it's really changing the consumer is changing and i i really feel the the need of our, all the brands and all the clients that works with Nelixia to have a sustainable source certified ingredient. And that's what Fairwild means to us. So it's perfect because it's aligned to the strategy Nelixia is using. So today we have one ingredient, which is a resin from El Salvador called Peru Balsam. But actually Nelixia's strategy is to certify the whole catalog Nelixia is having. So that's, that will be um, a value proposition for our clients saying, okay, you're sure that everything that it's sourced at Nelixia is sustainably sourced. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, but now we're gonna delve a bit more into some of those details you, you mentioned, Gus, in, in your presentation on the actual process of, of how you apply for certification um, and what that means practically. So there are a number of steps if you uh, sort of come to apply for Fairwild certification um, and I'll go over each of these in turn now and then Brian you will speak in a bit more detail about some of the things Gus alluded to as well in terms of how you might want to prepare for the order itself. So first off is determine, you know, is the species you're interested in certifying eligible for Fairwild. Um, so Fairwild covers wild plants and products derived from them. By wild we mean, uh, you know, is there no intensive management of the population. Um, we also don't currently certify um, invasives, but we're open to expressions of interest around that at the moment. Um, mainly it's, it's, it's as long as they're not being harvested, uh, invasives aren't being harvested under an eradication plan, um, we would we'd probably consider them um, outside of that. And for reintroduced and naturalized species, we, we would consider those on a case by case basis. So the first step is just to think about what species you want to certify and, and where are you wanting to, to harvest it from or, or which area are you wanting to, to certify. Just a note as well about um, fungi. So Brian, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the standard does also apply to fungi and lichen. Um, and that, that's completely true. The, the one thing is that obviously there are slightly different life characteristics of those um, of fungi and lichen that make them different from from a lot of plant species and that means that we just do need to consider applying the standard slightly differently for those groups. So at the moment we're in the process of um, thinking about how we need to adapt our certification tools for, for fungi and we're in the process of doing that at the moment and pilot projects um, on certifying fungi as Fairwild uh, will be underway this year and next year. So do get in touch if you're interested in being part of a pilot project on Fairwild fungi. So once you've got your, your species in your area and you, you're interested in certifying, the next step is to determine your readiness for audit. Um, and there's various um, steps we'd suggest for that, but Bryony will talk about all of these in detail in a moment, so I won't go over those for now. Once you've, you've gone through those processes, or maybe in parallel with sort of assessing your audit readiness, this next step is to have a risk analysis carried out. So Gus mentioned in his presentation as well, that was, that was done for Bioba. So this is a, a desk-based um, analysis process that is done, you organize it via the Fairwild Foundation, but it's actually carried out by the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group. So it's so a real experts in their field there carrying out this risk analysis. And one of the reasons we do this is that there are additional audit criteria if the species is considered to be high risk on the basis of this analysis. Um, and there's more details um, on what those additional criteria are available in the documentation that's on the Fairwild website. You would request this ideally three months prior to the audit and you can come to the um, Fairwild Foundation Secretariat uh, by email um, or there's information on the website in terms of what needs to happen to to set that process going. Um, but it essentially is a form that you'd fill in and submit to the Fairwild Foundation. Um, the form needs information such as the history of collection activities in the area and for the species you're looking at. Um, are there any subcontractors that are involved? Uh, the species and parts that they're going to be collected 
the abundance of those um, of that species in the area um, and any sort of specific characteristics of the area that the collection is going to happen in. There's a fixed fee for that risk analysis to be carried out. So that's 180 euros um, per species and country. So if you are wanting to harvest the same species, but from two different countries, then that would be two lots of 180. And then no matter how many risk analyses you're carrying out at the same time, there's one fee added on as well of 25 euros. So you'd fill in your forms and send them to the Farewell Foundation, and then we all take it from there in terms of arranging for the risk analysis to be carried out. Uh, at the same time, or, or sort of while you're, you're waiting for that process to complete, you, we would also recommend you then contact the accredited control bodies. So as Brian, you mentioned, there are currently four accredited uh, farewell control bodies, and all of their information is available on our website. Um, and they'll be able to really advise on the details of the audit. So um, the feasibility of an audit being carried out, uh, the timing of it, and also what the costs might be. So they are very much in charge of, of providing a quote um, and overseeing all of that part of the process. And we'd recommend contacting them at least four months before the collection season, because obviously the audit needs to take place uh, during the collection season. And they'll, that should give enough time, hopefully, to get that, that process arranged. They'll have their own application forms. So in addition to the risk analysis form, there will usually be a form you would fill in uh, to supply information to the control bodies. Um, and as Gus mentioned, often they can carry out more than one audit uh, type at the same time. So if you're also are interested in organic certification, for example, um, you can also inquire about, you know, having other audits conducted at the same time. So then once you've, you've had those processes carried out and you've, you've sort of got your, your quotes for the audits, um, you would then have a contract with the control body you've chosen once you've accepted an offer. Um, from, from one you've received from one of those. And then the audit will be ready to go ahead. The length of the audit depends very much on your specific um, circumstance. So, you know, what's how many species you're harvesting, what the area looks like, what the processes are and so on. Um, but the, what actually happens in the audit will be, you know, similar for, for each um, collection operation. So they'll visit the collection sites, they'll interview management and also processors, There'll be a tour of the processing, storage and purchasing, purchasing units, you know, as applicable. They'll review all the documentation and so on. And there's more guidance on what happens in the audit available on the Fair Wild website as well. As Bryony mentioned, we are currently trialling remote audits just because of the unique situation we all find ourselves in and that travel is, is not really possible to a lot of places. Um, at the moment, the remote audits are really only being trialled for currently certified collection operations. Um, we'll be reviewing this experience that we've had this year um, and developing a policy for, for 2021 based on that experience. Um, at the moment, it, it's not really possible for field audits, sorry, sorry, for remote audits to happen for new collection operations, but we are reviewing that on a case by case basis. So it's, it's not to say that it won't be possible to certify if you're coming to us new at the moment. Uh, it just means there'll be more maybe review of what the situation is. And we'll see what we what we do going forwards for 2021. So then once you've had your audit and the, the sort of reports have been analysed, um, the reports are evaluated by the control body um, and there will be a potentially a variety of different outcomes uh, depending on what that evaluation says. So it might be that um, there's a decision and, and you're certified and fantastic and then you just go forward and arrange the audit next year and, and carry on being um, Fairwell certified hopefully for many years to come. It might be that there's a, there's a positive decision so you are certified but there are also conditions um, which are imposed for certification to continue next year. So there'll be sort of points to address for example um, and those will be noted and, and shared with you during the report. It might also be that it's felt that you, you haven't met the criteria at the moment but there, there may be a discretionary window um, to enable you to address those any issues identified, um, which would then mean you could achieve certification in this year, or it might be that there is guidance, you know, given back to you and it, it's sort of, yes, you're not quite ready for certification at the moment, but um, here are the points, here's, you, you'd know your score and you can sort of reassess um, and maybe come back again next year and have, a, have another attempt at certification. And as soon as you are certified, you can now sell those um, ingredients that have been certified as Fair Wild. Um, which is great. That's obviously what we're 
we're hoping for and there are hopefully lots of brands that are eager um, to be using those fair wild certified ingredients and as Bryony mentioned that's where we can come in as well at the foundation in helping to sort of share that journey with um, businesses that are interested in fair wild ingredients and helping to make those connections. But now I'm going to hand over to Bryony for our last um, set of uh, slides before we go on to the, the question and answer session. So Bryony's going to tell us a bit more now about uh, some of those prep preparing for audit steps that we talked about before. Um, and then as I say, we'll go to your, your questions. So um, get your questions ready. But in the meantime, Bryony. Okay, thanks very much, Emily. Okay, next slide. Right, so as Emily introduced, there's really quite a few steps that can be done in terms of getting ready for an audit because we would definitely recommend that companies uh, arrange this once they feel that they are um, prepared for the audit to happen. As Gus said, I think by over took around a year really to prepare for the decision to go ahead with a fair wild audit. So it's definitely something to, to take some time to, to do. So I'll just go through these different areas. Right, so the Fairwild audit um, uses the, a set of performance indicators to assess the compliance with the Fairwild standard. These performance indicators are available on the Fairwild website. So you can download them and you can do a self-assessment against them. They're actually available in a large number of different languages. So um, French, Spanish, uh, Bosnian, yeah, there are actually quite a number of translations that are available. So please do check to see if it's available in a local language as well. Um, as mentioned, it's a continuous improvement approach. There are some requirements that are required in each year of the certification. So it's good to understand what is the, the minimum that's going to be needed in year one but then also to be aware of requirements that are kind of going to come in in later years of the certification because it's, it's never good to be surprised by something that becomes a requirement in year two or year three. Okay, uh, Gus has mentioned some of the preparation that they did before the Fair Wild audit. On the environmental side, it's really important to make sure that there's a good knowledge base um, around the species that, and landscapes that are being harvested. So a key area is really the mapping of the harvest areas. We'll need quite detailed collection maps that indicate both the location of the harvested population, but also any other important features of the area. So areas that um, should not be harvested, for example, alongside roads or um, any potentially contaminated areas like old quarries, those sorts of areas should also be excluded and that needs to be marked on the collection maps. Species identification is also really important. So there need to actually be voucher specimens that have been taken from the harvested area. Um, if necessary, if it's a complex um, species with a lot of relatives, you might need to get a formal identification done by somebody with a background in botany. If it's quite a common, well-known species, that might not be necessary. It really depends on the particular species involved. Another thing is to have collection instructions that really are specific to the species. So how much can be harvested from where, when, you know, the basic parameters of what can be harvested. And then as Gus also mentioned um, there needs to be a resource inventory and monitoring system that's in place. Actually in year one of the certification scheme, unless it's a high risk species, um, the data for this can, can be um, more basic and then be improved in later years of, of the certification scheme. But you do need to have um, some an overview of the amount of resource that's present in the collection area and an estimate of how much can be sustainably harvested. And that's something that will be continuously refined over time through the monitoring system. It's also important to make sure that the collection isn't having negative impacts at the landscape level. So the basis for this is really having a species area management plan 
This can actually be developed through the operator profile that you'll develop for the certification body, or you can have a standalone management plan, but really looking at the collection in the context of the wider lang landscape. We do have some similarities with organic standards. So one thing that's also important is to have some proof that no prohibitive chemicals have been used in the collection area. Okay, next slide. On the social side, in terms of legal compliance, it's obviously really important to make sure that any collection and trade permits are in place. That's basic documentation that would be checked during the audit and to have some proof of uh, access rights to the area. So if you're harvesting from a privately owned area, then you would need to have an agreement with the landowner that you have the right to, to harvest from the area. Likewise, if it's public land, there needs to be some documentation about the access rights. We also look at traditional use and access rights. So need to have identified who the stakeholders are for the resource, either in the local area or at the, at the national level, and to have done a certain level of documentation on the customary rights and traditional use. This can be within the context of the management plan, so it could be a section within the management plan, for example. For some species, it might be necessary to develop benefit sharing agreements, which might be related to the uh, fair wild system directly. So um, if the people who have traditional use rights over the ingredients are the same ones that are doing the harvesting, it might be that the actual payment system is appropriate, or it might be an entirely separate benefit and sharing agreement in, um, as is required, for example, by the national law. Okay, next one. In terms of the collector's management, um, an important starting point is to have a well-developed list of the registered collectors who are supplying the operation. There need to be good payment records. Obviously, in some cases, people do uh, may not be um, fully literate, but still the collection or operation needs to maintain those record systems itself and to work towards written contracts and agreements with collectors if that's appropriate in the context. On the involvement of children, it's important to have verified the age of the collectors who are supplying the operation and to make sure that you're complying with the specific requirements of Fairwild uh, for different age groups. Next one. Oh, next slide, thanks. So the Fairwild audit will also cover any formal employees of the operation. So quite often that's people who are working in processing perhaps rather than the actual collection itself, although sometimes the collectors are also employees. So it will cover labor rights and the auditor would also want to check contracts and payment records for the employees and to look for company policies, for example, disciplinary code or any other policies on, on labor rights. Uh, in the context of the national legislation, for example, um, making sure that holidays are um, given in line with what's required. Um, it will also check safe working environment. So it's necessary to have a record of any accidents at work and to have health and safety provisions in place. And the audit will also look at personal protective equipment and safety equipment that workers need uh, in practice, also collectors in the field. On the business side, uh, the traceability aspects will make sure that there's a record system that allows traceability right back to the origin. So records of harvesting, processing and sales. And then on the fair trading side, uh, we have a cost calculation approach for fair wild. So uh, does the collection operation have a cost calculation and price setting system that allows it to be profitable and also to negotiate a good price with with the buyers and we also look at uh, the relationship with buyers of the wild collection operation to also identify if there are any problems on the buyer side which fair wild foundation needs to take up through the registration system for for buyers next one 
in terms of the preparation, it is something that you can do entirely by yourself if um, you have the capacity to go through the checklist and do the preparation. There is also help available from the control bodies. They will give you a list, for example, of all the documents that need to be prepared for, for an audit. So there will be guidance through the process. But if it's a very complex sourcing arrangement, or perhaps if there are high risk species, it might be beneficial to have a, a pre-audit, which is an assessment that is done through the control bodies, but without the intention to be immediately certified. So it can give a bit more guidance rather than sort of a yes, no, you have met the requirements. That's an option. Um, you can also get some help from a consultant or a partner that has some experience with the fair wild system or wild collection in general. They can perhaps offer a longer term and more guided process. At Fair Wild, we don't have any official accreditation of consultants, but we do maintain a list of, of people and organisations that we know have some experience in Fair Wild, and we can make that available if you feel that you'd like to have some help in preparing for, for the, implementing the Fair Wild standard. We have a set of guidance documents available on the Fair Wild website. They cover different topics in more depth. So these are our documents and in some cases there's presentations that can be downloaded alongside them. Next one. And then there are a set of training presentations that are available on the Fair Wild website. So obviously today we can only give a very brief introduction to Fair Wild, but you can go through what really are the ecological principles, the business principles in, in depth there. Um, if you would like to have an in-person training session, please get in touch. Um, we can perhaps recommend somebody who could do that depending on where you're based around the world. We're also looking into potentially having an online option because I think that would be definitely the way the world is going in 2020 in any case. And um, I think there would be quite a lot of benefit from that. So if you would be interested in an online training um, option, please also get in touch because we're actively working on, on what we could offer around that in future. Next one. So yeah, I just wanted to finally finish on a thought that Fairwild really is a partnership approach. We have this very important principle 11 by a commitment. So any company that registers with us as a trader or a brand, we expect them to commit to this principle of mutually beneficial trade relations and to commit to pay the Fairwild prices and Fairwild premium. So we just really recommend that you before launching into Fairwild, or maybe in parallel, that you really have a conversation with your part trading partners. Can they support you? And please also get in touch if you would like us to present Fairwild to your customers so that we can help you secure some commitments to actually, you know, pay the, the cost of doing sustainability, which is a real cost. Um, so I think I will finish there and hand back to Emily. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bryony. Now we're, we're nearing the end of our, our webinar. So in terms of next steps, um, we'd say, you know, share the webinar recording once we make that available um, for anyone that you know that might, might have missed this or not been able to attend. And um, talk to the people in your supply chain about Fair Wild, you know, try and gauge interest in, in if you became certified or if you're not a collection operation, um, to those, talk to those that you buy from about maybe them becoming certified. Um, and then get in touch to arrange a risk assessment. As Bryony said, that's a great first step um, because you'll you'll know, you know, uh, would you need to consider that the additional prior the additional criteria for a higher risk species? We can also put you on our website and involve you in our matchmaking work if you've had a risk assessment done. So it's a really great place to start in your farewell journey. Um, and you can also find out more about all of these things on our website. We'd also like to leave you just with two events that are happening next year I and mean, we'll, there'll be many more than these but these are these are two we'd like to highlight right now so that we'll be doing the fair wild forum um currently planned for spring 2021 um it was going to be a, a physical in-person event but now we're evaluating you know whether it might make more sense to have it as as an online one depending on what the world looks like in spring 2021 um, but this is a really great um event which we we've ha we held the first one um a few years ago now and it's a really real chance to bring people together and evolve in this 
uh, while plant harvesting space to build capacity, share experiences, um, network, uh, have some training, um, and really have a platform for sustainability uh, professionals and, and wild plant harvesters to, sh to share information. So keep an eye out for more information on that. Uh, we also have an annual event, Fair Wild Week. Uh, so this is in June each year. Um, and the next one will be June 2021. And this is a, a week where we really celebrate what Fair Wild means and what wild ingredients mean to consumers, companies, um, and the environment. Uh, so keep an eye out for that as well on social media. Um, and finally, we'd just like to say thank you to all those uh, companies and our friends which have um, whose generous support has really helped us to, to continue with our work in uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, you know, it's really, really great what so sort of these extra donations can help us do and expand the sort of work of Fair Wild and the reach of Fair Wild. So we're really grateful to them. Um, and if you would like to donate, there's a button on our website so you can be featured on this slide in our next presentation. Um, but for now, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your questions, your involvement. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Um, and have a great day, everyone.